Thank you for joining us today for our virtual public meeting for the Watershed Restoration Project in the Shenandoah National Park. My name is Emery Hartz. I'm with WSP and I will be your meeting administrator. A few items to note while we are waiting for the meeting to start. Since we are in a virtual environment, participants will remain on mute to avoid meeting background noise. At this time, please check your audio and your viewing options, which is located in the upper right hand corner. Also, please note that this meeting is being recorded to post for viewing and closed captioning will be available at that time. If you have any questions, please enter them in the question and answer box to the right of your screen at any time during this meeting. As part of our virtual meeting standards, the team will wait to address your questions after the presentation. Slides are numbered. So if you have a question about a particular slide, please note the slide number with your question. And for those who are joining us by phone, we will provide contact information for you later in the presentation. We will plan to have about 30 to 35 minutes of presentation material, and then we will open it up to the question and answer session. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Patrick Cunney, the superintendent of the Shenandoah National Park. Patrick. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emery. Uh, good evening, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to join us tonight uh, to discuss this important project for Shenandoah National Park. Tonight, we are here to give you a better understanding of a proposal that's out for public comment and to answer your questions concerning uh, the proposal to restore the Meadow Run watershed. As the new superintendent uh, that just arrived here in October, I've only been involved for a short time, but luckily when I arrived, we have a very strong team uh, that have been working on this project for quite some time. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce the folks that are here tonight that will be giving a, uh, a, an in-depth presentation about the project, as well as answering your questions. Uh, from the National Park Service, uh, we have Jim Shaberl. Uh, Jim is the Chief in Natural and Cultural Resources here at the park, based locally. We have uh, Sarah Strickland. Sarah is the Environmental Planning and Compliance uh, Coordinator for the park, again, based here at Shenandoah. Michelle Carter is with our Washington office with the Environmental Quality Division and has been serving as our project manager to help us uh, pull this project together. We also have a couple of consultants that are with us tonight. Bernard Hay from WSP has been a, a great uh, source of help, as well as, as Anthony Offenkamp, who is uh, with Lim, Lim, Limnotech, sorry, Anthony, uh, who's provided us a lot of technical support for this project. As many of you know, this region has experienced uh, chronic acid deposition for some time. Um, and uh, Shenandoah has been impacted by this. Uh, the park streams, fisheries, and vegetation have seen the results of this deposition over time. Tonight, we will learn about a proposal here in the park that would do something for restoration of a small watershed located, located in the southwestern portion of the park, Meadow Run. Again, the purpose of tonight is to provide you a better understanding of the project and the proposal and to answer any of your questions. We are seeking written public comment and we'll provide some details of how you can do that later. Um, as one of the decision makers on this project, uh, I, I find that your input to be invaluable. So I would hope that you will take the time to provide your concerns to us in writing through the mechanisms that will be discussed later. Again, as somebody who has to weigh in and make the decision on, on this project of whether to move forward or not, um, this is really important. And I take your comments very seriously. The only reason we're here tonight is the results of a air, our air pollution case that reached a court settlement in 2017. We would not be considering to do this project if it wasn't for funding that came out of this settlement that would allow us to uh, restore lands and water from the impacts of acid rain. 
Um, again, there is no decision been made at this point. Uh, it is strictly a proposal at this point. I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Strickland, who's gonna begin the, the formal presentation uh, for us. Sarah? Thank you, Pat. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanna quickly run through the agenda for the presentation today. Uh, we're gonna start with a little information on Shenandoah National Park. We'll get into some background on the issue of acidic deposition in the park. We'll talk about the proposed action in Meadow Run and potential impacts from the project. And then we'll discuss next steps in the review process. Next slide, please. So many of you are probably very familiar with Shenandoah National Park. Uh, we are one of the largest and most heavily visited national parks in the Eastern United States with close to 200,000 acres. About 40% of that is congressionally designated wilderness. Shenandoah is home to a diverse array of plant and animal species and visitors come to the park to hike the over 500 miles of trails, camp, fish, and enjoy the views along Skyline Drive. Next slide, please. So at Shenandoah, uh, the National Park Service mission and the park purpose help us guide our decisions on managing park resources. Our foundation document identifies several fundamental resource values, uh, including healthy functioning ecosystems, clean air and scenic beauty. So these are all relevant to the project that we're proposing today. Next slide, please. So for some background on the issue at hand, acidic deposition, also known as acid rain, has been a problem for many decades in this region. Uh, this is largely the result of pollutants being emitted into the atmosphere uh, from fossil fuel burning, industries, and vehicles. Shenandoah National Park happens to be located downwind from many of these polluters and also, of course, contains many high elevation sites. So these things combined have led to high levels of acid rain being deposited in the park over the years. So the primary threat to park ecosystems uh, from acid rain is the acidification of streams and soils. Uh, and this leads to reduced habitat quality for aquatic and terrestrial wildlife through uh, lowering of soil and stream pH. So this can lead to uh, the loss of fish and aquatic invertebrates, both the loss of, loss of species numbers and also of individuals within each species and potentially impacts to health um, of these individuals. Uh, evidence also shows that um, Acid rain can impact the health of plants, trees, birds, and other wildlife. And of course, all of this combined leads to overall uh, decline in ecosystem health and degraded visitor experience in the park. Next slide, please. So it's important to note here that acid rain impacts areas of the park differently depending on whether it falls on a watershed with high versus low acid neutralizing capacity. And this, far, this factor is largely dependent on bedrock type in a given area. So you can see here in this diagram, uh, Shenandoah's eastern slopes uh, tend to have high acid neutralizing capacity soils. Uh, this is because they're formed on basaltic or granitic bedrock with higher levels of uh, base nutrients such as calcium. So as acid rain falls onto these soils and flows into the streams, the acidity is essentially canceled out by the base nutrients in the soils. Now on our western slopes, we've got a different story. Um, these are primarily formed on siliciclastic bedrock that has uh, lower levels of base nutrients in general. So the soils just don't have the same ability to neutralize those acids being introduced by acid rain uh, before they enter the streams. Next slide, please. So the good news is that uh, air quality has improved in recent decades uh, pretty substantially through improvements in technology and legislation. However, the problem now is that these acidified siliciclastic soils on our western slopes 
have been stripped of those base cations by so many years of acid rain. So we're still seeing the low pH levels in our streams. So you can see here the correlation between the bedrock type and stream pH or acidity. So while the streams on the granitic and basaltic bedrock there to the east and north are now remaining stable or showing signs of improvement uh, with improvements in air quality, uh, the, those streams on the siliciclastic bedrock to the west and south are, are not improving and we don't anticipate those to recover naturally for 100 years or more. So at this point, recovery depends on restoration of uh, those soil base cations through either the uh, fairly slow natural process of, of mineral weathering or through soil amendments, which is what the park uh, is proposing. Next slide, please. Why is the park choosing to pursue watershed restoration? Uh, we've got a few things going on here. So we do understand the problem pretty well. Uh, thanks to a long-term partnership with the University of Virginia, we have over 40 years of data um, to help us understand the problem with our streams uh, and to consider potential solutions. Unfortunately, many of our streams are listed as impaired by Virginia under the Clean Water Act. And without some help, uh, research shows that these watersheds won't recover naturally for over 100 years, as I mentioned. Um, Pat mentioned the court settlement um, that will, would be providing funding for this. Uh, and the park considered several different options and areas, and uh, we landed on Meadow Run to pursue this, this restoration project. Next slide, please. So why are we going with Meadow Run? Uh, this is one of the most impaired watersheds because of its bedrock geology. Um, also, its size makes it appropriate for this particular restoration project, given um, budget and logistical constraints. Uh, so you can see here Meadow Run is there on the southern end of the park. Uh, it's just east of the town of Cremora, and Skyline Drive runs along the eastern perimeter. Uh, the watershed is roughly 2,000 acres, uh, the majority of which is congressionally designated wilderness. It's, that's the darker green on the map here. Next slide, please. So data shows that Meadow Run is not recovering. In fact, it's still getting worse despite cleaner air. Um, you can see in this graph here that you know, many of our streams are recovering pretty nicely, but Meadow Run is still acidifying. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Shabrell to talk about the park proposal in Meadow Run. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. So our uh, proposed action for this approach is to use um, a helicopter to spread limestone sand um, across the landscape to add that buffering capacity that's necessary, the calcium and magne magnesium that's needed in the landscape. Uh, the two alternatives uh, uh, that we're talking about in the EA, the environmental assessment, uh, the first is our preferred, which is called a split dose, which means that it's two levels of application of limestone sand. Uh, the first being in areas that are, uh, it's more concentrated where it's needed. So roughly three tons per acre in those locations of the project where um, the lower dose, about two and a quarter tons per acre would be across the other lands of the project area. It's more of a, um, a surgical approach. The second uh, alternative is a uniform dose, which essentially is applying the, the same amount across all lands of the project area. So that's the, um, that's the approach that we're proposing today. Um, and um, if one of those options is approved, then we would go on and create an implementation plan. And that plan would include a uh, safety plan and public communication, how we outreach, how we get into those details of, of making this work. And of course, 
the, like any um, good work, we should track what our success is and to monitor the watershed improvement. So we intend to do that if we apply limestone sand. Next slide, please. So what it looks like, um, here's a, a map of the project area and um, that portion of the park. You can see the little blue triangles along Skyline Drive. Those would be potential staging areas. A staging area is similar to what you see in the picture next to the map, where uh, a pile of limestone sand is available for a loader to fill the uh, bucket. The bucket is that shiny um, metal uh, appliance there, and that's attached to the helicopter line to spread the sand itself. So um, we'll probably uh, need multiple locations for limestone sand and the staging areas. So they could be along Skyline Drive, or they could also be uh, off the park if we were to gain permission from adjacent landowners um, to work in that area where you see highlighted in uh, purple. Uh, of course, our goal would be to, up, to be near the park boundary or adjacent to the park boundary with a landowner and um, we would choose one or two locations within that area um, to have staging areas to be successful for the logistics of helicopter flight and making short flights. Uh, stockpiling could occur in other areas in blue or other areas not identified um, on this map, uh, basically material that we could move to the staging area. Uh, our flight paths are going to be as direct as possible between the staging area and the, the um, project to try to do the landscape uh, efficiently. And um, service landing areas would be the last feature where there's a few areas um, of those blue triangles that would work for a helicopter if it needed to land to refuel. Uh, we would not land in other areas of the park, only along Skyline Drive. More likely a service landing area would be uh, the nearby airport. Uh, which is more efficient for fueling and, and that kind of activity. Next slide, please. So this will work on a schedule um, where we focus primarily in wintertime to do this work in the wintertime. Stockpiling could happen as uh, soon as November um, of, a, of a winter, whereas the actual activities of helicopter flights would last about two to three months, December through February. Um, the operation would take a while. Again, we're talking about 3,000 or 2,000 acres of, of project area. Um, and we would fly this operation with good weather days, trying to focus on the good flying, safe flying conditions. And that might include weekends within the park, um, certainly weekdays and weekends within the park. But if we were to use a staging area outside the park, uh, we would limit that um, to take a break on Sundays. Sundays would be a day off. Um, of course, with a helicopter with that bucket attached on that line, we would have restrictions. We would not allow that helicopter for a lot of reasons to fly over people, um, houses, vehicles, those kind of things. It's a, it's a safety topic when that load is, is being carried that nobody is underneath that helicopter. Um, the closures for safety would be, of course, the project area itself. You see identified within that black line on the map. Um, that would be for the duration of the project. The um, two trails in particular, you can see in the dashed brown line, uh, Rip Rap Trail and Wildcat Ridge Trail would be closed throughout the project. The other areas on the eastern side of the project, the Appalachian Trail and Skyline Drive would be closed intermittently um, if there is helicopter activity on that fringe, that edge of that project area. But certainly if a helicopter is working in the west side um, of the project area, um, then it would be safe to open up um, the Appalachian Trail and Skyline Drive during those periods. So it would be on and off closures. Next slide, please. So we looked at a number of uh, impacts um, to um, park resources if we were to undertake this. Um, the first slide here is about um, soils. The remaining items that we won't talk about today are certainly in the environmental assessment. You can take a look. There are a number of areas that are pretty minor impacts and weren't analyzed within um, the EA. So you'll see those as well. 
the soils. Um, you can see pictures here of the lime, what it looks like on the landscape on top of snow, uh, that picture to the left, and then um, two tons per acre, the picture to the right, what it would look like on a, on a bare landscape. Uh, our, our modeling tells us that um, this would increase um, the pH a bit, uh, improve ecosystem health, soil health for well over 100 years. Next slide, please. Of course, this would also uh, benefit stream water quality. We expect pH of water to go up to around 6 or higher than 6.0. Um, by doing that, uh, we could remove, or the, the state could remove the, um, that particular watershed uh, from the list of impaired waters uh, because of that pH change. And then of course, stream health would uh, benefit with uh, increase in abundance of fish and macroinvertebrates within that stream, the bugs that live in that stream. Next slide, please. Uh, plants would benefit uh, from a long-term improvement uh, in plant growth and overall health. Um, the soil itself, the pH won't change radically, but um, it, there's a chance that acid sensitive plants may do a little bit better as a result of this buffering. And of course, anything we do that has to do with uh, disturbance, like um, concerns over the spread of non-native invasive species, we would uh, control by mitigation measures. We would uh, buffer those areas or um, control um, by follow-up work in those areas. Next slide, please. Um, of course, we talked about um, when this would occur in the wintertime when uh, it's dormant for a lot of animals in the park and also uh, migratory animals are off the park that time of year. We expect uh, no to minimal impact um, from the actual sand falling during the operation. Uh, the longer term effect would be that uh, species like birds who depend on uh, calcium rich food for reproduction, uh, that those would be bettered in addition to species that might be hindered from the low pH to include salamanders and snails, for example. So we, see, we expect betterments for all of those species. Next slide, please. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, 40% uh, of the park is wilderness and um, using machinery and um, equipment in and around wilderness is um, uh, an adverse effect. In this case, the helicopter would be flying over um, the wilderness area, which you, you see in the uh, cross hatched shaded area of that map. Um, and that would be a temporary adverse effect we would not land the helicopter in wilderness and therefore just fly over. So it would be short term. The long term uh, benefit would be an improvement on the natural quality of wilderness um, and should uh, benefit a lot of those wilderness resources like soils and streams and things we've talked about earlier. So a positive um, benefit to uh, wilderness character in the long run. Next slide, please. Of course, helicopters are noisy. And uh, so this table kind of helps us um, understand what that might be. So for this particular type of helicopter, we, we can see the um, uh, distance from the helicopter from a, a person or an animal. Um, if it's, for example, the first line 225 feet away from a helicopter, the noise levels, the decibel levels would be 92. And that's roughly um, the sound of a loud motorcycle if you want to compare it to everyday sounds and noises. So certainly very, very loud if you're 200 feet from a helicopter. Uh, of course, what's more realistic is a, a greater distance, uh, several hundred feet, or in some cases, portions of a mile, um, where you can see the decibel levels go down quite a bit as you increase distance, where a half mile is um, roughly the sound of a, a washing machine or a dishwasher for comparison. Um, any type of noise would have impact on park visitors in the area, um, neighbors, and wildlife in the area. Next slide, please. It's important to think about the project area itself uh, with regard to the operation. You can see the black line defines the limits of the project area. And if you look closely, you'll see that that follows ridge lines. So what we're talking about is application in this basin um, and so that will help us um, from a, 
uh, buffering so uh, of, of sound of a helicopter flying in that area if it's below those thresholds um, and elevations. So those ridges that surround the project area should provide even more buffering um, from outside areas and, and prevent the um, um, significant disturbance as far as noise beyond the project area. Next slide, please. Um, and the last category is visitor use and experience, where, of course, a closure uh, impacts visitors. We certainly know that uh, Skyline Drive has winter closures pretty often in the South District because of snow. So um, people um, who visit the park in that area know of those closures. Um, and what we're talking about is a, a winter long closure, at least in the project area. Whereas the uh, long term benefit we expect where visitor experience improves, uh, there'll be better opportunities for recreational fishing is, is our uh, expectation. And then wildlife observation and forest health as well. Again, bettering the, um, the visitor experience to that landscape. Next slide, please. Okay, I will be turning this um, presentation off to Michelle. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jim. Get this up here. So this is the third and final opportunity for public comment on the proposal to restore Meadow Run. We had the first opportunity in June of 2019, where in addition to set, accepting comments on the project website and through the mail, we had in-person meetings in Cremora and Charlottesville, Virginia. We also had two virtual meetings as part of that process. The second opportunity was in late October, mid-November of last year. We didn't have public meetings, but the park put out press releases and notices on social media, letting everybody know that we were accepting comments. And now we invite you to provide comments on our fully described proposed action and impact analysis that's outlined in our EA, our environmental assessment. This comment period will be open through February 28th. We'll then take the month of March to review all of the public comments, see if we missed anything, if determine if we need to make any changes. And if everything goes as planned, we hope to be able to make a decision early April. Next slide, please. So there's two ways that you can provide comment. Our preferred way of receiving comment is on the, uh, the project website. Um, and Emery, I'm gonna ask that you drop that into the chat feature right now so people have easy access to it. Um, on the project website, you'll find both the environmental assessment and a little project newsletter that summarizes the project. Um, we'll also be accepting comments, uh, written comments to the park headquarters. And that address is here on the slide. And, but as far as comments go, um, I wanna clarify that we're especially interested in feedback that addresses whether or not we missed something in our impact analysis or if there's other alternatives that, that we need to consider. Next slide. On the project website, you'll also find a link to an interactive story map. A story map is a visual guide that allows you to explore the project in more detail. It also has a video of a recent Forest Service project where they applied limestone sand via helicopter. So if you wanna see the uh, helicopter in action, check out that website. And so we're now moving into the question and answer session. Um, we'll ask you to type your questions into the Q&A box for people that have not done so yet. Uh, if you're having trouble finding that, there's a little Q&A icon like right at the bottom of your screen. And I don't know about you, but um, my little banner bar at the bottom went away during the presentation. So you might need to hover your mouse around there to, to see the little Q&A pop up. But that's how we're going to be receiving um, the, the questions tonight. Uh, the purpose of this session is to provide some clarification on the proposal, the things that we've discussed. If you have uh, comments that you want considered in the official project record, they need to be submitted through the project website or um, to the park via regular postal mail that we talked about on the previous slide. Okay, for those of you on the phone, contact information if, if you need it. Um, the project contact is the Chief of Resources, Jim Shabrell. And his phone number is 540-999-3500. Again, that number is 540-999-3500, and that's extension 3491. Um, you can get uh, that contact information also if you just go directly to the project website. 
But during this Q&A session, we're going to read the questions out loud. If you don't hear your question answered right away, just wait. We're going to try to put stuff together so we're answering everything at one time. And, and Emery is going to hop on here to help me if I get stuck or happen to overlook anything. So if you haven't done so already, please type your questions into the question box. And Emery, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. So the first question we have here is for Pat. Um, there's a question about access to the project area and concerns about um, about accessing a crossed private property and encouraging access to that uh, area that way. So, so Pat, if you would go ahead and take that one. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, we, we are very cognizant of the concerns of our neighbors outside the park boundary. Um, we would only be interested to work in working and we would only be allowed to work with a willing landowner that uh, that would be interested in serving as a staging area outside the, the national park. Um, you know, we, we are trying to minimize the impacts to our neighbors. Um, we would look for a, on the private lands outside the park, if somebody is willing, we'd look for that property to be adjacent to our boundary to minimize overflights over other properties. Um, so again, we're very cognizant of private property concerns and are trying to be a good neighbor and work with uh, only those folks that are interested in doing so. Great, thanks Pat. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, there's, there was a bit of concern about limestone sand possibly blowing um, onto to individuals or private property while it's in transport, knowing that um, maybe the, the, the helicopter bucket or the, uh, the trucks might not be airtight. So um, Pat, you're on video still? Okay, great. I didn't know if you wanted to answer. I was gonna turn that over to, uh, to Jim. And, and Jim, just really quick, you know, feel free to tap Bernward too if you need anything. Sure. So um, thanks for the question. And uh, that's a, a point of concern that we looked at in the analysis trying to uh, minimize that as much as possible. Of course, what we're talking about here is limestone sand. So as you can imagine, sand doesn't um, have the same type of dust as regular limestone, powdered limestone, that kind of thing. So, you know, sand will fall pretty quickly through the air um, and down to the ground. It won't drift as much as like a, like a cloud. So there'll be less dust. And of course, we'll do our best to mitigate the dust um, in the process. Um, there may be a way to put a cap on that bucket uh, at the bottom of the helicopter. Um, if you recall the project map itself, uh, there's a pretty good sized buffer between um, the park uh, project area and the park boundary. So any application of sand would occur wholly within the park and um, we don't expect any drift outside the park or onto private lands from that application. Um, and so we would do our best to minimize the, the effect of, of uh, in transit. And then of course, once we're applying um, the line by a helicopter, there should be buffer around that margin to um, avoid any drift onto um, non-park lands. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, and I think, Jim, you can keep your video on. This next question actually would be a good one for you. Um, they're asking if the helico helicopter would fly every day, Monday through Friday, through Friday, weather permitting, during, during the whole two months. Um, certainly that's the intent is to fly during um, good weather days. And so as long as the conditions are flyable for the helicopter and safe to do so, um, we would hope to keep rolling. Um, again, trying to minimize the full length of the, the project uh, duration. We mentioned earlier two to three months. Uh, if we get a lot of good weather, it should go pretty quickly, um, closer to the two month window, um, especially if we have multiple staging areas to base out of. So it makes shorter trips and a quicker time for the helicopter. So that's, that's certainly our goal is to try to um, fly when we can um, and that would include weekends in the park as well, both uh, Saturday and Sunday. 
whereas if we have a staging area off the park with landowner permission, we would not um, fly or use that staging area um, on Sundays, give it a rest on Sundays. Great, thank you for that. Um, and then a couple here about wilderness and uh, Jim, I'm going to pass it to you again. And if you want to tap, have somebody tap you out, like feel free. Um, but there's a question, well, a comment. It says that the, the reports and the data provided were, were excellent, which is thank you for the feedback. Um, but the question is, is that um, how is it that the project can be done when considering the provisions in the Wilderness Act? Um, and that being said, there's another question about why can't you apply the limestone sand by hand? And, and also feel free to tap into burn word for those numbers if you need them, Jim. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the first one is about, I guess, wilderness. Let's focus on that for a minute. Um, the Wilderness Act does have some prohibited, prohibited uses, things that you could not do. Um, and that would include uh, landing of aircraft or driving of vehicles or motorized equipment on the, on the landscape itself. Um, uh, aircraft above wilderness is not prohibited. Um, of course, it does have impacts and we're certainly cognizant of that. And uh, so we're charged with doing a, a separate analysis with regard to impacts on wilderness and we're going through that right now as well, um, trying to minimize that. But in general, this is a, a temporary uh, impact, temporary adverse effect on wilderness value. Um, but um, in the long term, uh, we see it as a restorative thing for the for wilderness and uh, doesn't include any of those prohibited things for, for wilderness. Uh, and the second part of the question was about access and trying to uh, do this another way. We, we reviewed a lot of different approaches to include uh, what was referred to early on was a bucket brigade, people trying to pack it in basically and try to carry uh, limestone sand in the locations for spreading. Um, when we think about the scale of this project in 2,000 acres, and it's pretty rugged terrain. If, if any of you have been in that area, there's a lot of rocky, cliffy areas. Um, it's a real challenge to get around um, off trail. Uh, so logistically, it's not feasible for us to do that on foot. It would take a lot of trips, a lot of people, and a lot of time, and um, might cause impact on wilderness from, from trampling and impacts across the landscape. So this uh, approach, even though it's noisy and, and does use a helicopter, is uh, the most um, efficient and, and effective approach, um, even though it does have those short-term impacts. Um, there's another question here. There's a couple here in the queue. Um, the other question, this is for Pat. Um, when will the park begin implementation if a decision is made in April? So our earliest that we would think to uh, move forward is December of 2022 and moving into early 2023 for operations. So December, January, February uh, over the 22-23 uh, transition. So. There's a question about, um, about how the park will reach out to private landowners for possible staging locations off of off of park property um, and what are the staging area requirements um, so actually I think Jim that might be a good one for you again sure um, so um, we would uh, contract with a helicopter company to do this work and the company would follow our our guidance and follow the contract to include um, reaching out to um, interested landowners to see if they would support an effort and um, what that would be for staging outside the park. So it, uh, it's likely that um, landowners um, in that case would be paid for the, the rent, the use of their land and the activity that occurs there. Um, and again, that would be managed through that um, helicopter company following the, the rules the park would uh, apply to that. Um, and so um, if you recall the map that we had, um, working outside the park um, does provide some efficiencies to kind of that Western edge of that area. 
And that's always something to uh, consider when we're talking about helicopter flights is it, it does take um, a lot of money to, um, to deal with that. And so we're trying to make sure that um, uh, we, we do this as, effect as efficiently as possible and um, that if um, landowners would approve, uh, that would include outside the park. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, Mark, uh, just to uh, respond a little bit more on that, uh, I know Michelle talked about, uh, this is the public comment period concerning the environmental assessment and, the, um, and for the, that will inform uh, the decision-making concerning whether to move forward with this project or not. I would just say from the park's perspective, we will continue to communicate about this project. If we make the decision to move forward with this proposal, we will continue to communicate uh, with in the community here to ensure that you're well aware of what we're doing, uh, what we would propose to do, where operations would be in a more specific uh, fashion than we could give you tonight. Again, as you can hear, there's lots of details that have to be worked out. But the first big decision that has to be made of whether this proposal should be should move forward or not, and that's the decision we're talking about tonight. As we move forward, there is a commitment from the National Park Service that we will continue to communicate with everybody in the community about this project. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, great. Um... Got another question here. Um, if the project is not moved forward, what will happen to the funding? Can those funds be used for cultural history projects, maintenance, or et cetera? Sarah, I don't know, is that something that you might feel comfortable taking on? Sure, yeah. Um, so, and Jim or Pat can jump in here, um, but I believe that funding um, and the consent decree uh, was dedicated to watershed restoration projects um, to mitigate for impacts of acid rain. So I think we would have to stick specifically with something like that. This is an excellent question. Um, I don't know if Jim or Pat might have an idea of what else we could use this for if we don't move ahead. The, uh, the uh, settlement had language from the uh, judge in the, in the court settlement talking about restoration and focusing on restoration. So that's, that's our, our challenge. We would have to design another project or think of another approach for um, restoration because of the effects of, of acid rain. That's the purpose of the money. Um, and um, I think we're restricted in using it for other things. Um. And there is a little bit more detail about the settlement agreement in the environmental assessment. So um, you can check that out a little bit too. And if there's further questions, feel free to reach out. Um, okay, great. great. Um, and then there's another question here um, about, let's see, about access to the park near the town of Cremora um, and wanting confirmation on uh, where this access is. And so, um, Pat, do you want to give that a shot? Sure, Michelle, thank you. Um, yeah, we recognize, uh, well, first of all, the, you know, the entire boundary of Shenandoah National Park is open um, and people are allowed to access uh, anywhere along the boundary um, of the park. Uh, we do recognize that there are private roads, uh, private posted properties along the boundary uh, that access cannot be, uh, uh, that you cannot access the park uh, by, unless you're in trespass. Obviously we're not in um, encouraging that. So um, we would, again, we're directing people to legal access to the park boundary in the wilderness area. Um, if you feel we have uh, uh, not made a, a good representation of any facts or, or details in the, in the document, I encourage you to write those in your comments and we can uh, address those when we move forward with our decision document. So the question is, what is the biggest risk? Uh, what is the biggest risk that would help keep this project from, from moving forward? Um, so um, I guess either from Pat or Jim, like, do you see, do you see any obstacles? Um, were there any concerns you had or, or, or challenges? Um, Thank you. 
I'll, I'll go first, Jim, and then I'll let you uh, add on and uh, fill in my gaps. How about that? Um, you know, this, this is a big project. Uh, you know, it's a relatively small area of the park, 2,000 acres within a 200,000 acre park. I'm using round numbers. Um, uh, but uh, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, undo some of the impacts that from acid deposition and, uh, and make a difference in, in this park. Um, there are risks with this project. Um, and uh, I think the, you know, we, we definitely need to be able to work in, in partnership with our, par our park neighbors to ensure that we're not having adverse, significant adverse impacts uh, to them. Uh, we want to be sure that uh, you know we're not totally impacting uh, the park visitors. Um, again, I think there's a lot of mitigation measures put in place and laid out in this document that help address that. If we move into implementation, there's risk. Uh, we're flying helicopters uh, over a landscape, um, and that's always a challenge. Um, there'll be weather issues and things like that. So there are definitely risks with this project. Um, we still feel like we've done a lot of good work to develop a plan that would allow this project to happen in a safe manner, that would have minimal impact uh, to our neighbors and to park visitors by timing things and creating buffers around the project area and things along that line. So there definitely are risk, uh, but we still feel like we have a good proposal uh, put in front of you. Jim, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh -huh. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, just one item about um, the uh, implementation plan. So if we did decide to proceed, um, the implementation plan itself would have um, a lot of effort toward um, safety, public safety, um, safety outside the park, helicopter, a lot of those risks would be even further um, considered and, and mitigated, trying to bring in a, another team of people to try to uh, think about that and minimize any risks that could occur um, from the operation. So that implementation and safety plan is, I think, key um, if we were to proceed um, to make it the, the, the safest um, operation possible. Question, uh, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and give this to you. It's about the court settlement, and they ask if the court settlement funds are expected to cover the cost of the entire project. Good question. Um, so there's um, the court settlement money um, is still sitting there waiting for the implementation. Uh, and so our um, intent is to stay within budget and that the, the costs of the project and all the work would uh, be funded by that court settlement money. Uh, also know this planning process is done separately and uh, funded through National Park Service funds, competitive funds that the park uh, gained um, to do this analysis and to do this review. So that's a separate uh, source of money that's being used for this process right now. Great. Thanks, Jim. I think this next one might be for you too. And feel free to type, uh, tap into Anthony if you need so to do so, because this is a like more of a science related question. Absolutely. So uh, the yeah. question has there been consideration given to the lime increasing the potential of phosphorus release from the soils in the project area and in stream bank soils downstream that could increase algal blooms downstream? So Jim, you sure. want to go first and then turn it to Anthony? Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll start and say, um, as, as far as we know in the analysis that we've done, that that is not the case, that, that phosphorus would not be released. But I'm going to go with our expert, An An Anthony, to, to um, help me out here. Thanks, Jim and Michelle. Yeah, so we did a detailed analysis of how soil chemistry would change um, uh, in the impacts chapter four section of the environmental analysis. So um, what I'm going to tell you is a paraphrasing of that analysis there. The short story is that um, the soils and um, and uh, the stream of metal run itself are otherwise healthy other than the acidification. So um, we are by design adding lime in order to improve the base cation status, which is a buffering status of the soils and therefore the stream, which would increase the pH. Um, 
that that will not release additional phosphorus or nitrate um, to the downstream uh, system and cause algal blooms, partially because this is um, a relatively pristine stream originating in a wilderness area. Um, it are, presently has very low phosphate and nitrate concentrations in the stream itself. The bedrock itself has very low phosphorus concentration. Um, and um, what's been shown is that if anything, uh, the depressed or the, the acidified soil conditions have kind of like halted a lot of the biological cycling of nutrients. And therefore, by, um, by adding the lime, uh, that will, those biological cycles will, will basically be kicked back into gear, which will help move those nutrients into plants and, and, and into a natural cycling process um, that, uh, that will increase the availability of the phosphorus to liming, but not increase its discharge downstream. I think, I think that's wrapped up unless anyone else wants to pipe in anything there. Anthony, we're happy to have you on. Thank you for that. That's a great explanation. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we have another question um, and I'll direct this to Pat. Um, if, if a decision is made in early April, when would the park expect to actually begin implementation? We would, uh, if we make the decision um, to move forward with this project, as Jim alluded to in his presentation, there's a lot of operational issues that need to still be worked out as far as details. Um, so the earliest that we're, we are thinking that we would go operational on this would be December of 2022. And the timeline for completion of the project is two to three months. So December, January, February of 22 to 23. Great, thanks Pat. Um, and uh, one more question for Jim. Um, how come the park did not consider uh, applying limestone by hand or animal? Right, we did hear uh, some feedback from the public in earlier sessions where we um, engaged uh, with uh, real public meetings back when we were face-to-face um, -face with folks and we got some ideas of um, a bucket brigade essentially is what they called it, where people would carry um, the limestone sand in uh, individually and they would be able to spread that across the ground on their own. Um, if you think about the extent um, of the work, we're talking about 2000 acres and uh, roughly over 5,000 tons of limestone sand uh, across the landscape, that's a whole lot of buckets. And logistically, we just don't think that that is uh, uh, viable. It's not very feasible to do this by hand. And of course, um, helicopters can do it in a, in a much more efficient way and get it done without much in the way of uh, ground disturbance in those activities. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, and you can stay on camera if you want, because I think this next question will go to you. And um, it's possible that you might want Bernward to chime in after you're done just to, to provide additional detail. But this is a great question. How do you control or measure the drop in reference to using helicopters and avid overlap in the prescription dose of liming agent with uncontrolled wind variables? So I can um, I can start, and uh, we're you know in in basically we're following uh, the lead of the Forest Service who did this uh, work. You know some of the pictures you saw earlier were uh, from a Forest Service application of of helicopters, and um, they um, also followed up with ground monitoring to see how well and effective the disbursement was. Um, so the um, the hopper on the lime bucket. Uh, spreads at a fixed rate. And so the helicopter company was working pretty closely with trying to calibrate that uh, application. And then uh, with, the, with people on the ground, uh, with trays measuring the amount of material that was falling um, down, the, down to the land and trying to see how effective it was, how uniform that uh, application was, it was surprisingly good from what I understand. Uh, Bernard, do you have more on that? Yeah, um, that's it's a it's an excellent question. Uh, of course, uh, first of all, the uh, limestone sand uh, would drop very quickly. It would take just seconds to drop to the ground. 
another variable to consider is that the uh, it, it's so it's not lime, it's not powder, it's it's actual sand, so um, it would drop drop very fast. The second thing is the helicopter can navigate very precisely, and uh, the third factor uh, to consider is uh, we we do allow for a range of um, of uh, of dose. And I'm going to let Anthony uh, embellish on that a little bit more in a second. Um, so it's not just three tons per acre for a specific area, but it's actually a range of uh, uh, 2.25 to 3.7, I believe it was. Um, and fourth, um, uh, we need to keep in mind that also the, the limestone sand dissolves into the groundwater. So the groundwater moves around a bit in the soil. So it kind of spreads around the effect. So it doesn't need to be exactly precise at any given location to have the desired effect. But uh, I'll let Anthony uh, add a little bit more on that issue as well. Anthony? Yeah. So um, in the appendix of uh, appendix B of the environmental analysis, we've, we've kind of described how we came at some recommended dosing uh, numbers. And um, just for clarity, uh, these, are, these are kind of soft recommendations. The final um, implementation plan will, will only be uh, worked on, and, and Jim or Pat can talk about this, after we uh, complete this phase of the environmental analysis. So this, it, we are not in an implementation phase yet. So these are kind of suggestions. So um, indeed, the split dose or preferred method would would be about targeting um, doses to, to better match the soil conditions um, that are there. And we know that um, the acidification of the soils depends on geology, the geological formation, specifics of the geological formation of the bedrock and um, a few other factors. So that said, um, we also know that, um, uh, that we're, you know, we're, we, based on experience from talking to, uh, to others, uh, specifically the, the National Forest Service and work that they've done in the Monongahela National Forest, um, they, they, they said, you know, we did a really great job of um, targeting the dose, but you should probably expect, um, you know, 10, 10, 15, maybe 20% error. So in our calculations, the, the environmental analysis actually assumes up to a 25% error in the dosing. So, um, which is, uh, from my understanding, easy to easy to achieve based on on, on uh, the experiences that Bern were just described um, with uh, doing this in the Monongahela. Any anyone else want to ask that or answer that? Okay. And I was looking at one other question. The 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 last part of that last part of the previous question also talked about um, variable wind speed. Bernard, did you mention that in your response? Because we did a bunch of research on making sure that we understood how wind could come into play. Can, if you didn't, yeah. So, so this uh, particular question, um, it seems to me, was geared towards um, making sure that the uh, the dose that we're trying to achieve on the ground uh, is not offset by uh, winds that are that are elevated. Again, the uh, the material that we have is sand. The helicopter would not fly far above the uh, the, the tree canopy, um, probably something in the neighborhood of um, 100 feet or so. So the fact that the uh, the sand settles very quickly again, it's not it's not lime. It's limestone sand, so it's not dust. In other words, it's uh, it's a coarser grain material, and uh, the sinking speed, the settling speed, um, fall rate, if you want, um, is is pretty high. So it drops off very quickly. So the wind comes into play. Um, maybe for the finest particles, but um, for any, uh, uh, but that's really a very, very fine fraction um, of the of the material. About ninety percent of the material is is indeed sand, and um, and would drop very quickly. And I just wanted to add that uh, there will there will be constraints on the helicopter um, as well with regard to wind and wind speed. So if it's if it's a challenging environment for the application or for the helicopter, um, you know it, it would be postponed that we would have downtime and until favorable conditions existed too. Great, I think that's good clarification, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, another question for you, Jim. 
Uh, is this the first effort to lime streams in Shenandoah National Park? Um, yeah, the answer in general is yes. This is the first time we're doing any type of restoration. Of course, this is a, a much broader approach. Uh, so we're talking about uh, applications over the landscape, 2,000 acres, and not just uh, the stream itself. Um, our colleagues in the Forest Service, uh, the George Washington Jefferson National Forest, uh, St. Mary's Watershed, um, they've done uh, stream liming where they've uh, applied the limestone um, material right directly into the stream. Uh, certainly that has stream benefits, uh, but doesn't have kind of that landscape restoration benefit uh, that we're trying to target with this application. So um, the answer is yes, this is the first time we've done something like this and we're hoping to get a kind of a holistic approach here. All right, well, it seems like there's no other questions coming in. So Pat, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to you for any closing remarks you might like to share. Okay, um, so uh, one point that I wanna reiterate, uh, it's specifically related to uh, use of lands outside of the park. Uh, I wanna be clear that the National Park Service is very interested in being a good neighbor and we would only be able to utilize those lands uh, with a willing participant, a uh, willing landowner that is looking to work with us. Um, there would be an opportunity for potential reimbursement for the use of those lands through this project as well. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear to everybody Otherwise, these operations would be contained within the lands that are owned by the federal government and part of Shenandoah National Park if nobody comes forward and is willing to participate. Um, again, thanks for taking time today to join us uh, to talk about this project. Um, this is an important proposal. Um, Shenandoah National Park is one of the crown jewels of the national park system, and uh, we're fortunate to have it in our community here. And this is an opportunity to potentially make some uh, to, to deal with some of the adverse impacts that the par park has experienced. Um, it's only a small piece of the of the of the park. It's 2,000 acres out of a 200,000 acre um, park. However, it is an opportunity to show what the benefits of this would be. And as the presentation alluded to, there are other areas that also have the, the are experiencing these uh, effects and we would be able to learn from this through the monitoring efforts. It's really important, uh, the slide on the screen shows you again the opportunities there are that, how to provide comments. Um, as one of the decision makers involved in this project, I really challenge you to uh, uh, provide those comments uh, to us. It is important to hear from the public about this project. Um, we as a team will take into consideration all the comments we receive. I, I, on behalf of the entire team today, I want to thank you again for being here and joining us and learning more about this project. Uh, if you do not, if you do have questions, I know like when I attend meetings like this, I always wish I would have asked three questions on the drive home. Uh, we've provided you a contact through Jim. Uh, that he's available to help answer those questions or at least be a conduit to get those questions answered. Um, so again, on behalf of the entire team, thank you for joining us. We look forward to reading your comments. Michelle? All right, and thank you very much, Pat. So just a reminder, as you see on the screen, to stay up to date, um, go to the, uh, the project website, check out the story map, and make sure that you get your comments in by the 28th of February. We really appreciate you joining us and have a great day. Take care.